morning, everyone. And welcome to our visitors. Uh, we've got tea and coffee after the service today, so uh, do stay and have a chat. Tomorrow we know it's all a bit more of a rush, so we don't, <laughs> we don't expect people to stay for tea tomorrow. But, uh, um, yes, and apologies, my own family, when faced with the prospect of church two days in a row, <laughs> balked and said, well, we could go Christmas Day. <laughs> so sorry, Peter. <laughs> Um, I don't think there are any special notices. Well, Mary, Mary wants to explain about this evening, and we do need to say that next Sunday there isn't a service here. We're invited to Woos Hill to share with theirs. Okay, anybody wants a lift, we'll sort that out during the week. And then there's an extra service next Monday, which Sober's going to conduct over Zoom. So you'll all have a Zoom link for... An extra service on New Year's Day. Uh, Sober's got a thing, he likes New Year's Day services. So he's gonna be... Mary's going to explain about this evening, and then Peter's uh, welcome to the pulpit in a few moments. As is our custom um, at midnight on Christmas Eve, we will be welcoming in the Christ child. Um, often we do this with communion. This year we're going to do it with a service of light. A sacrament is something that makes visible an invisible truth. Makes physical a non-physical reality. And sometimes we do this with bread and wine. Tonight we will do it with light. And we will welcome the Christ light. So, do come and join us at half past eleven. Good morning. Um, for for those of you who weren't here last week, uh, I'll go through. What's happening? The, the, the Methodist Connection have suggested that uh, we don't light the second Advent candle, uh, the red candle. So, uh, because it was for peace and due to the uh, conflict in Israel and Gaza, and, and it actually originally came from uh, the, the churches, Christian churches in, in Israel. Um, but there are more violent clashes uh, than at any time since World War II in the world. And about one... Do come in! Um, and in fact, about one in four people uh, in the world are directly affected by armed conflict, uh, according to the United Nations. So several of us thought that at this time we really must pray for peace. So here, in a minute, will be a prayer for peace. The, um, the next slide um, shows the, in coloured areas, just how many places in the world are affected by armed conflict today. So we will, we will light the white candle to help us concentrate our thoughts in prayer and in the prayer, please join in loudly uh, with the final petition. So let us pray. Dear Lord, Father of all humankind, we pray for your power and intervention for peace throughout the whole of this world. There is only one continent without such conflict, and Antarctica is very cold and not populated. We realize, Lord, that if this church gathering uh, of about 40 people were truly representative of our planet's population, 10 of us would be affected 
by violent conflict of one sort or another. These are our sisters, our brothers, our sons or our daughters, our fathers or mothers, all of whom are members of this human race. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, to show us how to live. Lord, we pray that you spread Christ's peace over the whole world. Amen. And Peter's now going to lead our service. Don't like that one. It is a light, even if only just. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Ian, thank you, Mike, and thank you all for your welcome. Um, Mike, I think if, uh, if our tribe were all with us this Christmas, they'd have come to the same conclusion as your tribe. Two days in a row is not going to happen. In fact, for Jenny and I, this is the first time in our... 41 years of marriage that tomorrow we, we will actually just be the two of us and uh, first time ever. So we kind of, in a way, looking forward to that. We, we've already had a Christmas with part of the family and our son's coming from America on, uh, on New Year's Eve. So we're kind of going to have a second Christmas on about the 2nd of January. So I think just the two of us tomorrow will, will uh, sort of do us nicely. Yes. Not so? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, our call to worship this morning. Lay aside your thoughts about cooking the turkey tomorrow. Lay aside any worries about whether you've got everything. Lay aside concerns about visitors or visits. And instead, fill your mind with the story of the stable. Feel the peace that the Christ child brings. Experience the joy of heaven at the birth of God's Son. And open your heart to the Lord. And let's pray. Father God, as we gather together this Christmas Eve, help us to look beyond the familiar to find something new in the ancient stable story. Help us to see the real people in the nativity scene, people full of hopes and fears, filled with questions and uncertainties, experiencing joy and pain. People who loved you, listened to you, and took risks for you. People just like us. Amen. And let's begin our worship and song. Let's stand to sing number 185. Sing with the King who is coming to reign.
Let us now approach God in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Father, how can we thank you enough for your Christmas gift to us? We give thanks as labor pains intensify, heralding Jesus' birth, the empty cradle, soon to be filled and overflowing with love. Love that touches, convicts, renews and blesses. We thank you for the joy that fills us as we wait with bated breath to celebrate our Savior. We give thanks for your loving glory which comes down this Christmas time. Amen. And a prayer of confession. God, you chose Mary, a young girl, not yet married, to take part in your story. You chose her for one of the greatest acts of obedience ever demanded. You asked her to risk everything. How must she have felt? Stunned? Puzzled? Scared? She must have wondered how Joseph would react. He would have refused to, he could have refused to marry her. The consequences would not have been pleasant. An unmarried mother, an outcast. Joseph, Joseph however, came good. But Mary agreed to your will, God, before knowing that. She put her whole life in your hands. Yes, she had total trust in you. God, your call on our lives will never be as great as that of Mary, mother of our Lord and Saviour. Yet still we may hesitate, have doubts, and question the consequences, and perhaps think the risk too great to follow through. Forgive our lack of trust, our doubts and fears. Help us to be like Mary, open to you, wholly obedient and trusting in all things. Let it be as you will. Amen. God sent Jesus as a living sacrifice to atone for our sins once and for all. Through him our sins are washed clean, forgiven and forgotten. Amen. And let us say together now the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing again now hymn number 187, The Angel Gabriel from Heaven Came.
Please be seated for today's Gospel reading. You can find today's reading on page 969 of the New Testament, and it's Luke chapter 1, and we're reading verses 26 to 38. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me according to your word. And then the angel left her. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mike. But there was once a son who's of a very wealthy man who expected to receive a sports car, the latest model for his graduation. Instead, his dad called him into his study, told him that he loved him, and handed him a wrapped-up present. When he opened it, he found it to be a box containing a leather-bound Bible with his name inscribed on the spine. Angrily, the young man tossed the box on his father's desk and stormed out, saying, With all your money, all you can give me is a Bible. And sadly, they never spoke again, despite the fact that the young man's father tried hard to contact him. Years later, the young man got a phone call to say that his father had passed away, leaving him everything. So he went back home for the first time since he'd stormed out. And as he was going through his father's belongings, he found that Bible still in its box. Rather curious, he took the Bible out of the box and opened it. The page fell open at a passage his father had marked, and as he looked at the page, he noticed that his dad had underlined Matthew 7, verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father give what is good to those who ask him? And as he read that verse, a car key fell from inside the Bible. It had a tag with a dealer's name on it, for that sports car that he'd wanted years earlier. On the tag beside his graduation date were the words, paid in full, love dad. Now our gospel reading is all about the wonderful gift that God had for Mary, a wonderful gift of a baby boy. And so what is our reaction going to be to God's wonderful gift for us this Christmas? Are we going to turn away from it, just as the young man turned away from his father's gifts, and so lose out on the wonderful present that was there? Or are we going to gratefully receive the gift, just as Mary did in our gospel story? And the choice, of course, is ours. 
Let us sing now a hymn based on that. Number 186, Tell Out My Soul. Perhaps for some of us, our goal this Advent season should have been perhaps to go from humbug to hallelujah. And for some reason, don't many of us find ourselves struggling with humbug feelings, if we're honest, during that Christmas season? There seems to be added stresses, pressures, hurts and frustrations. And the holidays we get around this time seem to magnify everyone for better and more often for worse. Psychologists tell us that Christmas is a time of intensified depression, conflict and loneliness. Jingle bells drowns out the cry of the baby in the manger. The message of God's son is lost to parents whose children have grown and moved on, leaving the parents far behind. The story of Joseph's support for, of Mary doesn't make sense to women and men whose spouses have gone, whether by death or desertion. Like a biting winter wind, this most wonderful time of the year sometimes is anything but wonderful. Now a couple, Rick and Judy Armstrong, had a rather hectic holiday schedule which encompassed their busy careers, their teenagers, shopping and all the required doings of the season. Realising that she would be short of time, Mrs Armstrong thought it a good idea to have the stationer print their signature, the Rick Armstrongs, on their Christmas cards instead of having to go to the trouble of signing each one. Soon to their surprise, they started getting cards back from friends signed, the Modest Morrisons, the Clever Clarks, the Successful Smiths. Then she discovered the stationer's subtle mistake. She had mailed out a hundred cards neatly imprinted with Happy Christmas from the Rich Armstrongs. I'm sure they laugh their way through that mistake. But sometimes during this time of year, when things go wrong, it's easy to throw up our hands and say, what's the use? Sometimes things just seem to be too much. Now, the beginning of our gospel lesson this morning had a word in it that I would draw your attention to. The angel, when he addressed Mary, used this word twice. Just listen to what he says. Hail, O favoured one. The Lord is with you. 
And then again, the angel says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. So the word favor is used twice in those verses. Yes, it is favor or favored one. Mary had found favor with God. Chosen to give birth to God's only begotten Son is no small thing. When we think about Mary and the baby, we think about the animals arranged neatly in the stable. We picture warm glowing lights. We see a halo over the head of Mary and the babe. When we think about Mary and her favored status, we think everything was easy, everything was neat, everything was good. But then notice another word in verse 29, but she was greatly troubled at the saying, and considered consider in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. Mary was troubled at the saying. She didn't go out and seek this favored status with God. God came to her through an angel. Mary was surprised by the grace which, with which God had found her. And Mary then says in verse 38, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. And Mary then consented to act as God's way of bringing, bringing grace to the whole world. Mary was graced by God, but was it an easy life or a difficult one as one is graced by God? The Gospel reading is all about a wonderful gift that God had for Mary, the wonderful gift of a baby boy. But receiving it wasn't as simple as that, because Mary wasn't married. And in those days, that was a serious problem. We don't often appreciate, perhaps, what courage it took, it took on Mary's part to, bring, to agree to bring Jesus into the world. Now, in Mary's mind, there would have been three very real fears. Each of these begins with the letter S. The first was getting stoned. The second was being set aside. And the third was the stigma of illegitimacy. So the first S, she could have been stoned. Having a child out of wedlock in Jewish society in that day was a capital offence. You could be stoned for it. In fact, it's even mentioned in the Old Testament that that is prescribed uh, for an adulteress. It's very much like um, extreme aspects of Sharia law in some countries today. Second S, she could have been set aside. Mary risked losing her fiancé, Joseph, who would naturally think that she'd been sleeping around. It was very easy at that stage for Joseph to have abandoned her to her fate as an unmarried mother. And of course, there was nothing like a welfare state in those days for single mothers. And the third S, she could have given Jesus the stigma of illegitimacy. And her son would have borne that stigma, a horrible birthright in those days. So as you read the story of the angel Gabriel announcing to Mary, she will conceive and bear a son, Jesus, let us not forget how brave and courageous Mary was when she said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Besides having to endure all the gossip, imagine how awful it would have been to ride a donkey all those miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It was a tough and wearisome journey. Bouncing around on the back of a donkey couldn't possibly be a delight for a pregnant woman. And when she got there, there was no hospital no doctor, no comfortable surroundings waiting for her. She couldn't even find a place at the inn. So she had to go off into a stable with the presence of cattle odour and beds of rough hay to lie on. There in the humblest of surroundings, the king was born. You call that favoured, but there's still more. What happened after Bethlehem? Joseph and Mary with the newborn king were out on the road as refugees in order to escape Herod's massacre of the children. Way down to Egypt they went, mainly on foot, I would think. Then it was back to Nazareth, back home. But back home to what? Possibly obscurity and poverty were perhaps the trademarks of Joseph's uh, family. Then as her oldest son grew, she became more and more proud of him. Humble people loved him. But as he began his public ministry, the powerful ones regarded him with increasing hatred. People were beginning to line up either for him or against him. And Mary's heart must have ached. And then one Friday it happened. What she feared came to pass. Her son was led up to a hilltop amidst a jeering crowd, led by priests and rulers of his own nation. And there on that hilltop, her son hung upon a cross. 
as his mother stood beneath that cross and cried. So if, is this what you would imagine to be favoured meant? I'm sure probably not. But Mary was called upon by God to bring God's presence into the world. Mary had that kind of faith and that hope and was also willing to risk life, reputation, honour and a loved one so God's plan could be carried out in this world. She learned of the plan of salvation from God's messenger. And though she was afraid and I'm sure she wondered how this plan was going to be fulfilled, she decided to take the risk. She decided to have faith, to believe, to trust, to have faith in God's plan, God's bridge for the world. For in a sense, Mary was helping God to build a bridge between God and the world. And that bridge would be like no other bridge. It would be a human bridge, be a baby born in a manger. He would grow up teaching others about God's love. Mary was helping God to build a bridge of reconciliation, a bridge which would link God, the Creator, and His creation, man and woman. Mary understood her part and the risks, and she was willing to do this. She said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be, let it be to me according to your word. God's presence in this world came about because He found Mary, and bestowed his grace upon her, and Mary said that it was okay. And being called by God does not mean a life of ease. Remember what Mary had to endure, and of course, what Jesus had to endure. Now some years ago, there was a, a, a Christmas card that was very unique. Um, I don't remember the exact description on the card, but I remember, <coughs> excuse me, if, as you looked at the picture of the manger scene, you would see the beauty of Mary holding the baby Jesus, appreciate the quietness of the animals gazing at these humans, and you could almost from the card feel the warmth, the peace and glory of God. But you would also see in the rafters of the stable on this card, the, on this card of the manger, a cross, and the shadow of that cross falling across the baby Jesus as he was being held by his mother, reminding us that God had come to earth he had to be born. He had to experience a human condition so that his redemption might come for all of us when he hung on that cross. Mary, Jesus, the birth, the life of a carpenter, the cross, all had just one purpose, the redemption of the world. So the Christmas event is not difficult to understand. It began with God's grace or favour coming to Mary and ended not on Christmas Day with the birth of Jesus but on Easter, Sunday with the resurrection of Jesus. And in a way, if we think about it, it's that simple. But perhaps many of us miss the point. Many people get caught up in wondering about virgin births, about God becoming man, about how one can rise again after one is dead. And we really need to be like Mary and have faith. Faith that allowed her to say yes to the angel. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Perhaps many of us are like the man in this story. There was a man who didn't want to go to the Christmas Eve service with his wife. He decided not to go because he couldn't believe the gospel story. It just didn't make much sense to him. So he settled, as his wife went, he settled into his comfortable chair and picked up the evening newspaper. He noticed it was beginning to snow. Later, as he glanced over the top of the paper, he noticed that the wind had picked up and the snow was coming down really hard. He went back to his reading, but then suddenly he was brought back to reality by a large noise on the, front, uh, the large front picture window. The noise happened again and again, so he decided he'd better check it out. When he got to the window, he noticed a couple of small sparrows had flown into the glass pane and were fluttering in the snow drift below. He could see through the snow a larger group of birds perched in the bushes and shivering. He thought about their plight, so he slowly went to the hall closet, put on his overcoat and went out the front door. He decided to open the barn door so the birds could roost in the shelter for the night. He picked up the wounded sparrows and brought them to the barn, hoping that the other birds would hear their chirping and follow. But they didn't. So he thought of using the Hansel and Gretel trick 
of placing breadcrumbs on the path to the barn. Certainly, he thought, the hungry little birds would follow. But they didn't. The man didn't know what to do next, so he decided to get a broom and chase the birds into the barn. But this proved futile also, for the waving of the broom just scared the birds even more. Finally, in a state of exhaustion, he sat down on the barn step and thought, if only I could talk to them, let them know I wanted to help them and save them from the cold winter storm. But I can't unless I could become one of them. Become one of them. Just then the church bells began to ring and the man, in a moment of realization, knelt in the deep snow and said, thank you God for becoming man. Jesus was God's wonderful gift and is God's wonderful gift to us. How will we react to that gift this Christmas time. Amen. And we sing now number 178, Long Ago Prophets Knew. We come now to our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, take away fear and give life, light and hope. Advent is drawing to a close and Christmas is almost upon us. So we pray for humanity around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those like Mary and Joseph, who were far away from home on a journey and ended up as refugees in a strange land, reliant on their own inner strength and faith, reliant on the deeds and goodness and kindness of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who travel to meet with family and friends, those who travel to help strangers and neighbours, those who visit with gifts and kindness, compassion and care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who have journeyed in Advent, with unsettling news of health, well-being, or economic and social situations. 
for those who are ill or dying, facing uncertain futures, for those who fear losing homes and livelihoods. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our world of excess and shortage, of wealth and poverty, of unequal sharing of passion and neglect. May eyes be opened, may ears hear, may hearts be stirred, may hands be offered, and may environments be protected, and life be treasured. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mary was the woman called by God to give birth to the Christ child. She was seen as worthy and able, and given respect and purpose. We pray for women today who, because of their gender, are disrespected, abused, shackled, locked away or ignored. We think especially of women under the Taliban rule in Afghanistan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we sing, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. We know that the Holy Land is far from a peaceful and quiet place this Christmas. We pray, we yearn, we cry for peace, for harmony among peoples, among faiths and religions. We pray, Lord, that your presence can and will change everything. But for that to happen, your people need to hear your call and answer yes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for courage and faith as we live out our lives this Christmas and beyond. Courage to stand up, stand out, speak up, speak out, walk tall and follow your call. We pray for faith enough to lead us on, to give us vision, new life and renewal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And now we go, we'll bring up the offering for this morning. Thank you, Mike. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the wonderful gifts that you've given us throughout the year. And at this time, Lord, at, at Christmas time, we thank you, Lord, for the greatest gift of all, the gift of your Son, who gives us so much and gives us hope. And Lord, we just give thanks and we pray for the, for the money that is given, for the way, in, the way in which other people in this church give through their time, through their skills. And we just pray that you'll bless those who have given and those who, who receive the gift of these blessings. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 188, There's a Light Upon the Mountains.
Our Lord, we will sing of your love forever. Everyone yet to be born will hear us praise your faithfulness. We will tell them God's love can always be trusted. God's faithfulness lasts as long as the heavens. Psalm 89 verses 1 to 2. Lord, let us feel your steadfast love and sing your praises this Christmas time. Let us proclaim to our friends and family how great you are. Let us see the power of the baby in the cradle. Let us say yes, let it be this Christmas time. Amen. Amen.